I'm Rocky Jacobson, the founder of Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. In case you haven't heard of those calls, uh, we've been around about 30 years now. This is Troy Neiman, one of my pro staffers. He's from the Portland area, or do you want to say someplace else? Uh, <laughs> from Oregon. <laughs> Just expand the boundary a little bit. Yeah. And most of my seminars, how many have ever attended any of my seminars before? Yeah. Okay. We usually, I talk a lot about setups and, and uh, bugling and what sounds to make. This seminar we're going to cover kind of the same thing, but we're going to do it on a biological side of the animals and show you why these animals do bugle, why they do cow calls, why they make location calls, display calls, and all this. And we're going to combine it together. Troy's going to do the biological side of it, and I'm going to do the calling side of things to show you the, the sounds that they do make and what they mean. And we're going to reiterate it with a video of elk to show you what they really do. And we can kind of, like Troy said, we're going to put dot to dot for you and can connect it off basically is what it amounts to. So I'm going to let Troy take over and uh, enjoy it. I think you'll get a kick out of all this stuff we're doing. It's, it's different. So. Any folks here ever been to the Northwest Elk Academy? Are familiar with it? It's an academy we've been putting on here in the Northwest for quite a few years. I'm just curious if anybody here in the class has been to it. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm a uh, registered Oregon outfitter and a guide. I um, also do a lot of fishing and charter. Um, I met Rocky through calling. You know, he's a long time ago had the visions of being a big help caller at the World Championships, but then I fell in love with pursuing the animal more hunting. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, I designed the Northwest Elk Academy to really try and take away kind of the product side of things and bring more gold nuggets to people about elk hunting, which are what are the things we see in the field with biology and data? You know, how, why does this animal do what it does? How do we connect those dots? Um, so today what I want to do first before we get started, I'm just curious, how many of you have ever seen an elk in a Jeep? You think an elk would fit in a Jeep? I did. Uh, Any elk, I don't know. <laughs> well, just for curiosity's sake, I guess an elk will fit in a Jeep. So, no, I just thought this was funny, kind of an icebreaker. Um, I saw this actually over in Eastern Oregon one day. I was coming down to the mountains. I saw this at a cafe. So I spun around and had to take a picture of it. Who in their right mind would do that? No. So anyway, I thought that was kind of cool. It would have been a whole lot no. easier to quarter it up. In all seriousness, um, this is where it's really passionate and fun is pursuing elk. And one of the blessings that I was able to achieve is I got to study elk in captivity for about 20 years. And a good friend of ours here in Oregon owned about 3,500 Rocky Mountain elk. And I used to have access to those elk, and I used to be able to parallel what they were doing in captivity with what they were doing in the wild. And that being said, to kind of summarize, first we're going to take a look at the data science, right? Break something down by the science. Well, in the data science, we have one of the biggest experimental projects in the nation for elk, which was called the Starkey Project. How many of you guys have ever heard of the Starkey Project? Okay. What I would uh, summarize for you guys without having to read the book, kind of bring it right down to the gold nugget, is the data. And what the data told us about the Starkey Project is that younger elk, when grouped, breed later. Older elk, when grouped, breed earlier. Okay, so I want you guys to remember that. That's a nugget. So when you go hunting in an area, it's really important to know about the density of the herds you're hunting. How old are they? Is there older elk grouping with older elk? Or is it a group of younger elk? So remember, young elk tend to breed or breed late, and they have poor calf survival. Old elk tend to breed early and have very strong calf survival. So it's really about regeneration of the herd. Does that make when sense? When you say earlier, you're talking like a couple of weeks earlier, like in September. Could be the last full moon of August. So how many of you guys have ever noticed big branch bulls that are herd bulls, usually four years old and older, are fully rubbed out by August 18th? Have you guys noticed that? Okay, the reason why is Mother Nature knows that animal's in the prime. It's the mature animal, it's the dominant animal, it's the breeding animal. So when that animal meets or groups with older cows that are five and six years old, it's typical for cows to come into heat on that first full moon in August. And so this will play a really key factor in just a minute when I talk about a cow's cycle, okay? But the nugget for this out of all the data is that older animals breed earlier, like a month earlier, and younger animals are going to breed later. So it's really about their age and the density. Does that make sense? No. 
I don't think it does. I, it, isn't it just when the cows come in heat, they're going to breed up? An old bull or a young bull is going to breed that cow if it's ready to be bred. It's all about the cow, which I'm going to hit in just a second. So you're going down the right trail. So the science tells us, um, oops, take away that slide. So first off, what's elk's primary diet? When you guys think about the animal, what is it like to eat? They're primarily grass eaters and they want the really rich, high protein grass that's found on high mountain slopes right after snow melts. So it depends on the time of year where you're looking for elk, where the rich protein food is at. So food is one of the key awareness factors in any unit you're hunting. If the mountains are really dry and really hot and all the grasses are cured and you're up high and you can't find elk and the water sources are limited, where do you think the elk have gone? Bottom. They've gone down to agriculture. So they've gone down to the farms and the ranches where there's water and there's rich protein grass. So it's just one of those things to watch is were there spring rains? Has there been any snow lately? What's going on with the weather and the heat? So it's all about the nutrition. So nutrition plays a key factor in elk behavior and movement. If, okay. you, if you notice this year we had a lot of drought, a lot of fires in the mountains, the grass wasn't growing as good, so your elk numbers were down by quite a bit. They didn't bugle a lot, their nutrition wasn't good enough for cows to come into heat. So a lot of your animals move to the valley where there is farm ground, better nutrition. And all of us are kind of bummed about that because we're on public land, can't go on private ground. All the bulls are right there. And that's what happened this year in a drought season. We lost a lot of our elk moving out of the mountains and headed low because the grass was gone due to fires and drought. That's why there was much, not much bugle season going on at all. There was very little talking because some of the elk that were left up there, one bull, five cows, they don't need to bugle anymore. They got what they need, but when they group up together, they get more active, they go into their elk frenzies and they breed better. Now throughout the season, the food sources will change. So we all know that as we go into fall, and the grasses get wet and they get moldy and start to get the rain and the snows, once grass is not no longer readily available, they'll move to algae and ponds, they'll move to lichens, they'll move to mushrooms. So when bulls are recovering in the fall and late season, if you have a late season tag, look for bulls in deep, dark timber where there's algae, mushrooms, and lichens. If there's no grass available, that's short. How many of you guys ever noticed you come to a meadow, the grass is really thick, it's super lush, but you don't see where it's been grazed or chewed and you don't see any elk sign, but yet it looks like the perfect habitat. How many of you guys have ever seen that? It's because elk don't want to eat the big, thick, tall grass. You got to move up on the hillsides where the grass is thinner or where cattle have been grazing, gold nugget. When cattle graze, they don't rip the roots out of the ground, but they mow it. And elk love that short, really rich protein grass. So that's one of the keys to remember. I know when I'm hunting in an Idaho, our elk are grazers also, but they're also browsers because we have red stem, willows, alders, all that kind of stuff, so they'll eat that. But uh, when I first come to Oregon to hunt, I went to those areas looking for willows and uh, red stem and that. I couldn't find any. Couldn't find the elk, so I started looking in the bottom grassy deep valleys that deep, no elk. So I ventured to the top where the rock hillside and those little shoots of grass come up that high, elk everywhere. So that tells you they love that tender little vittles. So the moon, this is just, and I'm going to move through some information really quick because we don't have a lot of time today, so we're going to unpack this really simple. So the moon, how many people think the moon has an effect on elk behavior? Anybody say, yeah, I think it does. How many people would say, I don't think the moon really has any effect on them at all? How many would say, I just don't know? <laughs> so there was a book that was written that I studied called Biological Time. It was written by Bernie Taylor. He's an organ biologist that had a project in college and then it went further into the state. He was part of the Starkey Project, but he wrote a book called Biological Time, so I want to give him the credit. He studied the effects of the moon and the lunar calendar on all species, fish, big game, everything. And then he wrote his hypothesis based on the data he saw. So instead of having to read the whole thing, I'm just going to summarize it for you real quick. One of the key elements that's really interesting are these three petroglyphs. Have you guys ever seen this before? This is really interesting about what people before us left for us to see in rock in three different places of the world. They didn't know each other. This was back in my time. So this is Lascaux, France. This is a petroglyph here from Lascaux, France of probably a red stag. This petroglyph here was from the Umatilla Indian tribe that was up in a rock up by the Columbia River. 
And this was over in New Zealand, where there's red stag, right? But what are the common denominators here? Do you guys see anything that just sticks out at you? That you'd say, wow, for three different petroglyphs in three different parts of the world, where's, what's common about them? They all look like an elk. Okay, they all have full growth antlers, probably meaning that the animal's in the prime of its life. Peak nutrition, peak activity, peak time of the season. Make sense? That's one of the things we can take away. What other things do you see that would look common? There's something that has to do with moon phases, I can tell you that. So notice here we have a square box, possibly referencing a calendar or date time, and then we have 13 dots. Here we have an animal that has 13 slash marks on its back, and here we have 13 tick marks on the top of the elk's back. Interesting. So in tying in with the moon, what these petroglyphs were speaking is 13 days from the full moon, when animals group and at night and get active, they have pheromone exchange. It causes breeding cycles. Kind of like when humans have parties, they hook up, right? You get close, it gets dense, people get attracted, and it's a biological event. So every year when we have the moon, every month, it's a full moon, the animals group. 13 days later, which is mornings and evenings, is the best time to hunt. They even left stuff a hunter, and they even showed that it had younger animals with it. So it's giving you information about peak time, 13 days after full moon, best time to hunt, mornings. So this is, this is just information that people before us left us in petroglyphs. So I just wanted to anchor that. So let's summarize it real quick. So with the moon, what we know from the studies, and this is true for fish too, is on full moon nights when it's light, that's when you get mating, peak mating and breeding, grouping. You get migration, the animals group and move. You get grouping, so they're all coming in close contact with each other. You get active all night. They're very active at night. And so uh, they rest during the day. So the day is not their busy time. When we're dark all night, that's when we get antler shedding. It's when we get the best calf dropping or fawn dropping. It's also, they're active at dusk and dawn. So you gotta think about hunting. Are you hunting on a full moon? Or are you hunting on a full dark new moon all night? So knowing that, on a full moon, when do the animals go into bed? Right at light, like 5 a.m. So you ever notice that? You go out on a full moon night, and they're going to bed right when you just got out there. But on a new moon night, they can stay out till 9, 10 o'clock in the morning feeding and stay active. So one of the key takeaways on this and the key thought is hunting strategy, right? So when we look at hunting strategies, on full moon nights, hunt in the middle of the day. If you go out in the morning, go in the dark, try to find them in the dark with bugles, move to where they're feeding, but no, they're gonna move right at sunrise. And they're gonna go to bed three quarters of the way up, benches, they're gonna go to the places where they get the wind, they get humidity, and they get cover. So if you wanna hunt good bulls, and you know what your moon cycle is, try going where they sleep and they hang out in the day and hunt them in the middle of the day. So in the mornings when the bulls are following the cows, they, they normally will bugle as they're following the cows. You're not gonna call that bull back to you because he's headed to bed with the cows. So your best bet is to follow them and to stay with them as best you can and get to that transition spot where they are starting to figure out this is where they want to bed down at. And go ahead and bed down with them 100 yards away from them. Just take your time, lay down, take a nap. Because at about 11 to 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, somewhere near, they're going to get up. They're going to get anxious about going to water, check their cows and all this stuff. And you just lay there and pretty soon you're going to hear a cow or maybe a bull just real lightly bugle. That's telling you something's moving. Because a bull won't bugle unless those cows move. So they get up out of their beds and head to water. The bull gets up and stretches. This is when you've got a chance to call that herd bull in. And you got to keep the wind in your favor and it's very hard during the middle of the day because it swirls everywhere. So a little tip, try to find a shady little draw, a shady tree, get behind that call from because that wind currents are more steady in the shade than they are out in the open. As soon as you go out on an open hillside where the heat is and the sun's hitting, that wind is going to go everywhere and it can go right back to those L when the game's over. So it's really a tough situation during the middle of the day, but it's very successful if you play the game. I've killed several bulls in the middle of the day. My son, Corey, with Elk 101. He killed most of his elk in the middle of the day because he plays that game of following the herd and wait till they get down and he stays there with them. Uh, it's a tough game because I'd rather get back to camp 
sleeping or maybe having a good <laughs> lunch or something, which everybody does. But uh, if you want to kill those herd bulls, middle of the day is the best time to do it. So this is, there's no doubt the moon plays a, an effect. Oops, sorry, here. hitting the thing here. Come on. So there's no doubt it plays an effect in behavior. All great information to know. It's part of data and awareness factors, but at the end of the day, no excuse to get them. You gotta go out and hunt, right? You gotta be out there. So that's one of the keys is stay out, stay hunting. That's one thing that I do. I don't worry about the full moon. I hunt every day. So I'm gonna hunt during the full moon and I'm gonna hunt during the days after and everywhere else. But I adjust my strategies because of the moon. You just change up and adjust to what's happening. Don't worry about the full moon. But if you only got five days to hunt, and that's it. And you've got to pick a week to go out on. Pick those 13 days. Yeah, 13 days moon. after full moon is usually peak behavior that's when they're the vocalizing time. the breeding. We're Cows fortunate enough astros. to where, like myself, I get to hunt every day. It, it, I mean, that's, that's my success story right there. If I had to pick five days to hunt, I probably wouldn't get an elk every year. But I get to hunt every day of the season. So some stupid elk's going to eventually come by me. <laughs> That happened this year, 28 days I hunted every day before I killed an elk. And uh, there have been days I've killed in the first hour, first day, you know, but you gotta have a lot of time to hunt elk to be successful every year. So don't think I'm the greatest hunter just because I kill an elk every year, it's because I put the time in. I get out there and I hit it hard. And there's some things that I can tell you to make your success more easier if you only got five days to hunt, but it's tough. Your success ratio is going to go up, up if you get to hunt every day, and it's going to go down if you only got five days. So that plays a big part in your hunting success. This next piece is the last piece of biology. We'll just wrap up and get into the language real quick. Is speaking to this gentleman to his thought is the cow estrus breeding cycle. So this is critical that the Starkey experiment data confirms. So remember when I told you older animals are going to group, they're going to go into heat exchange, they're going to breed earlier, younger ones are going to breed later. Well, Starkey knew that when they took the older bulls out and they put young bulls in to breed young cows, they hardly had any breeding, it was really late, and all the calves that were born were hardly of weight and they died. When they put the older bulls back in and they put the older cows back in, they bred a month earlier, the cows had full peak weight and the, the calf survival was 100%. So this is biological data from testing at Starkey Experiment. I, I paralleled that with the ranch I studied with 3500L, saw the exact same thing. The landowners even confirmed, wow, they really do come into heat right after that full moon. I said, right, because they group at night, it triggers the cow. But this is critical. Each cow, depending on her age, you guys hear what I just said there? Each cow, depending on her age, all cows aren't the same and they're not the same age. So you got young cows, medium age cows, and old cows. So it's really important to talk to your biologist in the unit you're hunting to find out how old is the average cow in those herds. Are they three-year-old cows? Are they five-year-old cows? Are there 10-year-old cows in there? How old is the density of that herd? Here's why. When a cow comes into heat, she only comes into heat for 12 to 18 hours. She doesn't come into heat for three weeks. She doesn't come into heat for three days. She doesn't come into heat for a week. She comes into heat for 12 to 18 hours. That's one day. If she doesn't conceive, she's not impregnated, she'll come back into heat 21 days later. Okay, so let's reel this back. If I'm a seven-year-old cow, I'm a pretty old cow, well, I'm gonna hook up on the August full moon with a big bull, and we're gonna breed. And I'm gonna conceive the third week in August. And then I'm gonna carry that calf all the way to spring, and it'll be full birth weight, and I'll have great survival. That's Mother Nature's way of regenerating the herd. See how that works? If I'm a really young calf, or a cow, and I, I don't come into heat until late September. Might not even come into my first heat until October. So it's the age of the animal at their peak behavior on grouping when that cow comes into heat. So that debunks a rut. There's no such thing as a rut. Biologically, it's when that animal is ready to come into heat based on the lunar grouping. You see how it works? So either older animals we know come in earlier. That's why the bulls are rubbed out by August 18th. They know they're ready for the older cows. They're ready. And how many of you guys have ever seen the first weekend you went out, you saw bulls breeding cows in a full rut, August 22nd, 28th? Have any of you guys seen that? I've seen it year after year after year because I know where the herds live and I've got them on film doing it. And then three days later, they're done and the cows leave and the bulls go back to bachelor group and you'd think for the next two weeks they never came into rut. But the bulls already bred the older cows and you didn't see it. 
See, Mother Nature knows the, the, the pattern. Um, so knowing this estrus cycle is why when a cow comes into heat, if she doesn't conceive, she'll come in 21 days later. So it could put one cow at August, then again in September, October, and then November, if she doesn't conceive each of the four times. But if a cow comes in in October, she might not conceive and come in again in November, then December, then January. And I've talked to people in late rifle season that said, whoa, we saw this big herd that was like 300 elk, and they weren't doing anything. We called them and nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, an hour later, one elk walked through the middle and the bulls started screaming. And then all of a sudden they went into full rut behavior and the bulls were chasing it and the whole herd got excited and it was like, what? And I said, it's because a cow came into heat. A late cow came into a third or fourth cycle and it caused those bulls to know because of smell. The animal knows, we don't. Because it's just like, how many of you have seen dogs when your dogs come into heat? Well, you don't know the females in heat, but the dog sure does. So that's what we don't understand because we can't smell it. So you have to be out there to observe it. You gotta remember that bulls have glands in the roof of their mouth and they can go around and they suck this air in with their tongue and go do that glunking sound and that tells that bull whether that cow is in heat or not. That's why you see a cow or a bull following a cow right on her tail a lot of the time and all he's doing He's licking and smelling and he can, t he can, can tell feel the heat whether she's ready to be bred or not. So it really is a biological timing it's a grouping and it's a density and age of the animal that triggers it. Now we come in and all here comes all the awareness factors like barometric pressure, weather, hunters, predators, fires. Those are all things that come in and affect their behavior. But does that make sense so far? I mean, I'm trying to kind of walk you down the biological path of what elk behavior is before we get into the language. One thing I want to bring up too is barometric pressure. I have a hunting partner that he has barometric pressure readings on his watch. And he'll get up in the morning, he'll go 28.9, he'll go back to sleep. <laughs> today, bugling today. Barometer dropped out. Barometer too dropped out. Next morning, 29.9, 30.1, let's go. He knows, and this is, we've studied this for 10 years, and I can't get him out of bed when the barometer is low. <laughs> so whenever a low pressure comes from the west or a front comes, you usually get a two to three point dropout in the barometer. How many of you guys ever noticed before a big weather pattern hits, elk usually come out, they're very active, they're super playful, they're excited, and it's like they know, and then all of a sudden the weather comes in, the three layers of clouds and a little bit of wind, and all of a sudden they hunker down, they break up, and you don't hear them for two, three days. It's like, where'd they go? They knew that barometer was dropping, and so that's why they got all playful, getting ready for a three-day lull. Does that's that make sense? That's snowstorm comes in and it dumps a bunch of snow, everybody thinks, oh, this is gonna get them fired up. They just, they are dead. Yeah, they just, they'll just and the snow around. starts dripping out of the trees and the blue sky comes up and they start firing up and they're bugling again. So let's break down the language. So now that we know a little bit about elk behavior and a little bit about biology, now let's apply it to their ability to communicate. And this is where I think there'll be a lot of gold nuggets for you guys. I've seen people over the years where they just connect dots here and go, aha. What I want to share and what Rocky and I really want to ingrain is that elk are incredible. They, they live in groups or families and they know each other. They live with each other, they know each other just like you do when you call on your phone and your mom answers. How did you know it's your mom? You can't see her. How do you know it's your daughter? How do you know it's your son? How do you know it's your friend? It's because you recognize tone. One thing that I notice too when you call, like I call, I'll call my daughter. I know it's her voice but I can tell that she is upset about something. And elk can do the same thing. They can tell when that cow is wanting attention or not wanting attention. They vocalize. And so what we want to emphasize on this slide is elk vocalization is about respect. They recognize each other, they social rank each other, and they communicate with each other. They do it for order, they do it for control, they'll vocalize in movement, they'll make sounds when feeding, they make sounds when they're in peak breeding cycles. They make sounds uh, during stress. I mean, have you guys ever seen elk when they make vocalizations because they're stressed, or they're scared, or they're freaked out, or they're curious? So we want to break down how this animal vocalizes and why, but understanding that they have an amazing ability or a language to communicate. So the more we know that, the more we can begin to apply strategy. Right, Rocky? So let's break it down. Here's where I'll explain a little bit about the sounds and then I'm going to have Rocky, as an elk calling world champion, demonstrate the sound. And then we'll back it up by the elk showing you the sound. And hopefully it makes sense what's happening. 
So the first sound I want to talk about is cow sounds. And I'm just going to break it down. This is as easy as I've ever found to break it down. Cows make these basic sounds, but let's talk about what they mean. How many of you ever heard of chirp? Or think you might know what a chirp is? The chirp is a casual communication call when elk are moving. When they're just getting ready to move, or they're on the move, or they're slowing down from moving. They do really short duration, high pitch calls to each other to stay in contact. Rocky demonstrates it with a mouth read. You can do it with an open read. There's lots of different tools to make the sound, but the key is to know what the sound is. Now there's calves, medium age cows, and old cows. So you could fluctuate the tone, but the key is the chirp is short duration. Casual movement call, okay? The second one is muse. Now the mu is just a chirp that's relaxed, elongated, that's lazier, and it's when elk slow down in bed. When they slow down to start feeding, when they stop, they'll start to mew. And as they mew, they're relaxed. So when you hear that and then you start hearing they're slowing down, they're relaxing. So it's a good thing to know when you're pursuing a herd or you hear a herd coming in or you're hearing it. So there's the chirp and the mew. And Rocky, you can produce these with bugles, latex, mouth reads, open. There's so many kinds of calls that will produce these sounds. It's really about just knowing the sound and what it means. Now you combine those together is what we call communication talk between the elk. It's cow chirps, cow mews, cow mews. Right. Go. So he's doing a little bit of calf, a little bit of cow, and a little bit of excitement. So he's combining them. So that's just using elk language. So the third sound is estrus. This would be a cow that's excited, okay? A lot of other guys like to call it hyper hot. They, they name all these names to it. Biologically, it's an excited cow. Whether she's excited about breeding or she's just excited because her new calves are near her or she's excited because a bull's got her all frenzied up, it's an excitement call. And what cows do is as they get more excited, they'll take the mew and they'll really stretch it out, but they'll, on a register, they'll go up and down. It'll, it'll be like whining. So this call creates urgency. It's demanding. And it's when excitable. They get, when they get to the point where they haven't been bred yet and they're ready to go out of their cycle, they get very urgent and they get excited. They want that bull to find her right now because she's about ready to go out and they'll go into what we call a, the hyper hot or the estrus buzz or whatever you want to call it. Now go. Very demanding call right there. Bulls hear that, they know that cow's going out of heat. So they're usually going to bugle and come in. Usually multiple bulls will come in on a cow, especially if you break off a herd and start doing that. That's a cow in her last 18 hours that knows she's going out of cycle. I'm going to give you a little so she's demanding you're doing that attention. hunting. You don't want to do it all the time because it's a very short little segment when it happens. And if you're walking through the woods all day long doing that estrus butt, they know there's something wrong. So you want to be close to your herd. You want to hear the elk already in a frenzy before you ever do that. Be close. They're cow calling, they're bugling, they're, you'll hear the estrus buzzes. That's when you do it. Don't go out there and think you're going to call doing him it. because an estrus buzz is going to call him in from a mile away. It's a certain situation when you can use that estrus buzz and make it to work. Now the whining, how many of you guys ever heard of puppy dog whine? You know, they do that. <laughs> okay, elk will do that too. So when they're estrusing, there's excitement in the herd, there's mews, a lot of times you'll hear a cow start whining. It's just more excitement. It's a higher intensity of excitement. Have you guys ever heard this? A lot of times you have to be near a herd when they come into that frenzy, but you'll start hearing these sounds going, whoa, I've never heard elk do that. Um, the other one is grunts. So Rocky and I'll break down grunts a little bit. So how many of you guys are on elk? Maybe you were popping sticks, maybe you were hiking, maybe you threw out or tested a call, but off in the distance you heard a soft form of a grunt. But you couldn't see it, but you heard it. You knew something was going on. And a lot of times you'll hear a grunt like this where elk will know you're there, they'll hear you. They're curious, so they'll reach to you to show yourself. It's a lot like a, like a puppy dog bark, kind of a It's real soft, it's not real sharp, and it's not an alert call. 
Boom. The second one is barks. How many of you guys have ever heard barks? Okay, what happened in the bark? Anybody? Alarm. What's that? The alarm. alarm. The alarm. Okay, so everybody pretty much recognizes there's definitely an alarm bark, right? <coughs> yeah. Like, oh no, he just saw me, he smelled me, he knows we're here, or she knows we're here. They'll do this really sharp. <coughs> See that? <coughs> there's a lot of intensity to that. <coughs> Versus a bark rock you'll explain to you that bulls can do if you're acting like elk, popping sticks, maybe making a call, language, a bull might come in and break down that kind of bark. You want to do it now or when we get into the bulls? Uh, you can introduce it now or then. I, mean, well, I just thought it's part of the barks. It's called a nervous bark. And uh, they, they'll come in and not see what's going on, but they want to see what's going on. And they'll do this real sharp. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they'll bugle after it. <laughs> it's really kind of fast, everything's fast, everything's sharp. They want you to show yourself. And so you can't walk out of the hunter and go, here I am. <laughs> You've got to play back that game. If you hear that bull do that nervous bark with a chuckle after it or a bugle after it, go ahead and copy. Do the same thing and that's telling him that you won't show yourself, but you come show yourself. You make the move first, and sometimes they'll do that, and it gives you a chance to get that bull to come to you, even after a bark like that. Now, bugles. How many of you guys have ever seen a cow bugle? Or you chased the herd all day and kept hearing a bugle, but you could never find a bull with the herd. It was always calves and cows. Have any of you guys ever experienced this? We've had lots of people in the academy where they'll say, man, I chased a herd all day, and I kept hearing this bugle. It was weird. I almost thought it was a spike, but it was a bugle, definite bugle. But every time we saw the herd, there was never a bull with it. It was always cows and calves. They didn't know cows can bugle. So same voice box, same throat, same ability to communicate, cows will bugle. And they bugle for different reasons. It's almost a cry. You guys ever heard that? So cows do it, um, and we'll show one that does it. But so that's the cow sound. So now let's kind of review it real quick. Let's let the elk confirm what we talked about. Notice how alert they are? They're starting to move. They're getting a little anxious. They're not mewing, they're chirping. It's because they're getting ready to move. Versus a herd that's totally relaxed and isn't nervous at all. Notice ears are down, no nervousness, not moving. Long, casual mute. And here's what happens if you're hunting and you apply too many estrus calls and you're really pushing the breeding behavior, it can get confusing. I'll teach you how to do it. Yeah, let, let me let me remind you. <laughs> this is tough. Yeah, that's how you do it, dummy. So we call that too much estrus. <laughs> Then of course there's the warning bark. Watch the body English. Versus a curious elk. They know you're there. They heard you, they see you. She's looking, she, she knows I'm there. It's a little, a little bit different. A white tail will do it with his leg, his foot will stomp the ground. And they do it with their voice. So now let's break down the bulls. Is this helping? Is this connecting some dots? Okay. 
So with bowl language, everything's the same. same. Same anatomy, same voice box, just heavier and bigger, but they communicate a little bit different. So bowls have this fascinating, most beautiful thing called bugles. How many of you guys have been out there in the fall and heard the bugles in the timber? It's like a symphony or an orchestra. It's really pretty to hear. Um, so bowls have a language of bugles. They have these things called chuckles, glunking, muse, and all this other components we're gonna add. But let's break the bugles down. How many of you guys have heard a bugle? Okay, I know you heard the cow bugles, so you heard that one. But let's talk about the four basic bugles to understand. The first bugle a lot of us have heard is what we call the casual locate. And that's when a bull's relaxed. So a lot of times this is a bull just getting up. It's a bull maybe that's going to bed. It's a bull in the middle of the day maybe that's just getting up. A lot of times at morning sunrise, right when the sun pops, that's the call you'll hear. And that's just typically a bull reaching out to the forest saying, I'm up, I'm here. Is anybody out there? So it's very casual. Just in the hunting end of this, this is the sound that I initiate first in the woods is a location call. I don't want to go out there and do a challenge call because most of the elk probably don't want to challenge you. So I use the location call to see what that bull will respond back to me with. And it'll tell me his attitude and then I can change up if I need to. But I always initiate the location call first. It's just a, a nonchalant, easy call. Sometimes I'll soft. chuckle, sometimes I will, but if I chuckle it's soft and short. <coughs> Not aggressive. So that's what I like to start off with to get a bull to answer me back. I'll walk the top of the ridges, bugling off in the canyons, and do those sounds until I get an answer. And sometimes those bulls will come back with some of the sounds we're going to get into, and that tells me what attitude that bull is in and I can switch you up. Your best rule of thumb, anytime a bull bugles a certain sound, if you don't know which one to do, <coughs> matching, copying. It pisses him off because it's just like anybody, if I'm saying something to you and you copy me. <laughs> anyway, that's what you do to a bull. If you don't understand the language totally, just go ahead and mimic what they're doing. Mimic them. So the second bugle to break down out of the four is what we call a display bugle. So Rocky was showing you a real non-intimidating, very casual locate bugle. But there's another bugle called the display bugle, usually when a larger bull is present with cows. And he's displaying his social rank, he's displaying his size, he's almost asking the cows, I'm worthy. And it's a what we call the full bugle. <laughs> you guys have ever heard that around cows usually in a herd okay that's that's usually a herd bull or an older bull and he's displaying to the cows it's a it's an advertising call then there's another bugle that's called the screen challenge bugle and it truly is a bull to bull communication challenging a bull and Rocky why don't you demonstrate to us what a bull might do to challenge another bull <laughs> So the difference here is he added a ton of aggression. And he really screamed, so the, the name serves it well. It's a scream bugle, where a bull will get real aggressive, it will throw a ton of intensity into the call with a lot of aggression and challenge another bull. But it's not a bull to cow call. Cows usually sit there, feed with their ears down, could care less. So it's a bull to bull communication. The fourth bugle is what we call the herding bugle. And this is a bugle a lot of times you might be pursuing a bull that's got cows, and maybe he's moving in the timber, and you keep hearing it going, man, he must be big. And it's that big guttural, sounds like a moo cow. It'll be that, Aah! almost like a bear. What it is, is it's a bull with his head way back. He's trailing his cows, grouping them, and he's pushing them away from you. He's moving his harem away from pressure. So he'll do a herding bugle, which is that lip ball, gnarly. <laughs> Okay, how many of you guys have ever heard that? When you hear it, a lot of times we think just, you know, starting out hunting, oh, that must just be a big bull. Well, all the bulls can do it, but it's a type of bugle. It's a communication. It's a herding communication versus a challenge communication or a locate communication. Does that make sense? So it's really important when you're out there and you hear a bull answer or you hear a bull first, really gauge what he's telling you. 
Is he locating? Is he challenging maybe another bull? Or maybe he heard you walking below popping sticks or raking, and he threw a massive challenge at you because you're in his neighborhood. Makes sense? So they use language to manipulate just as we do. A lot of my seminars, I teach being versatile in your elk calling, and it's very important to learn a lot of different variations of sounds. Elk do not like repetitious sounds. They catch on to those things very quickly, and they understand that it's danger when they hear the same old sound <laughs> over and over and over. And one of them was the <coughs> the hoot your mama. <laughs> That worked good for a few years, but all of a sudden they caught on. <laughs> they to caught it. on to it. But butts and dust call, we call it. Yeah. So now the second part of the bugle that I think is the most important thing to learn about bugling is the chuckle. How many of you guys have heard the chuckle? Okay, the key to the chuckle is the rhythm, or what we call the cadence. So what I learned in biology, and I learned watching elk in captivity, and then I was taught it from a guy that ran the Starkey Project, and I've heard it in competition is there's a chuckle that's really deep and slow and guttural. That's a cow calling chuckle. That's a bull using conversation display with a pleading call to cows to accept me. Then there's a chuckle that's super high intensity, fast and choppy and really aggressive with the scream bugle. And that's a bull to bull challenge call versus a cow calling acceptance call. So show us what the challenge call chuckle might sound like. <laughs> it's fast, it's choppy, it's got intensity, and it's aggressive. That's a bull-to-bull -bull challenge call. And I'll show you in video where cows could care less about it. They don't even lift their ears. So it's definitely not cow communication. The other one is a slow. Show us what it, maybe a big herbal displaying might do to, to accept his cows. <laughs> See, it's softer, it's deeper, it's guttural, it's part of the display. It's advertising. It's a, this whole thing is a mating game. It's a biological event. <laughs> we want to make it a sport. They're actually doing what they're supposed to be doing to reproduce. When it comes to hunting, it becomes an emotional game. You've got to learn to put emotion in your calling. You can't just go out there and just do the same old sound over and over and over. You've got to learn to put emotions into it. And that's true in predator calling, too. When you're out there, you've got your e-caller, it's the same old sound over and over. And that's fine and dandy, but you need handheld calls to put emotions into it to get those animals to commit at a, a better rate. Convince them you're different. And elk are the same way. Now, mews are the same. A bull has the same voice box and anatomy, so a bull can mew just like a cow. So it's not unheard of to see a huge bull, you know, maybe a 350 class bull come up behind you at 20 yards and just do a really simple cow mew. <coughs> Something really simple. And you turn around and be like, you gotta be kidding, that came out of you? You know, and they're just checking you out. Squeals, you might find with a spike. You might hear it in a bull that maybe is just excited. You can hear it in cow bugles. Maybe show us what a spike or a cow bugle, how they're kind of similar. That's pretty common of a spike. So sometimes you'll hear it, see a herd and you'll be hearing that, like, where is that? You know, that doesn't sound like a very big bull. Could be a spike. Sometimes it's a cow. Mm -hmm. I've seen a cow excited doing that. Um, so then the barks are very similar. We covered the barks, which there's the warning bark, right? Maybe Rock can demonstrate that again. A real aggressive, sharp warning bark. <coughs> Have you guys ever had a bull do that to you? Okay. Then there's that grunt, what we kind of call the soft grunt or the nervous, where they know you're there, they, they hear it, but they're so curious, but they can't confirm it. Have you guys ever seen that? And that's like that soft bark where you're trying to find out, where are you? So now let's let the elk demonstrate and prove our point. No aggression. Cows don't care.
accepting the cows, or he's trying to get them to accept him. It's almost as if he's in love. Notice the difference? It's not aggressive challenge. He's in love. He smells, he wants him to take it. That's the bull getting nervous, wanting to push his cows. That's that herding bugle. <laughs> How many of you guys ever heard that sound? The glunking? <clears throat> so these are just some bowls I, fume, I film or I've picked up when I've been out there. So the glunking, it's really hard for humans to reproduce that. But the key is, don't really have a rhythm to it. Make it very sporadic and random or use your tube. Sometimes you can get the end of your tube with your head on it. See how that works? It's okay, but it's you can hear the slap of your hand sometimes too. But the glunkin is the hardest thing to come up with. It's very hard to do. I've kind of figured it out a little bit with a diaphragm, but it's good enough I fooled elk with it, but I don't know if it's good enough to so say I sound just like one. <laughs> To kind of wrap up, I know we only got about five minutes left, so what I want to really kind of wrap up now is now that we've kind of shown you the biological data science behind the elk, understanding the age, is the age of the animal and the density, and then now looking at the timing because of the lunar effect and the moon and the grouping and what triggers that cow to go into heat. Now we've broken down the language by sound and what it means. Now it's how do we take all of this and apply it to tactic or strategy? And what I want to kind of leave you guys with is think of it in three phases. Whether it's Rocky Mountain elk, whether it's Roosevelt elk. Rocky Mountain tend to migrate, Rosies tend to be very local, and they live on a very close circuit. They, they know their feeding spots, they move on a six to day, seven day cycle, unless they're bumped by pressure. But when you get into elk, think of three seasons. Think of the early season, territorial, breakup. Early breeding with old cows on that moon. Remember, only 18 hours of estrus and then they're done. Then it's almost like you go another three weeks of nothing until the next full moon comes on, which groups them, which creates excitement again, which is why that third week in September on a full moon, just after, it can be pretty fun, right? So a lot of guys go at the end of the season. But think of the early season as your early season territorial. This is the time of year when bulls are raking, they're establishing dominance, they're marking their area, they do wallows, which urinate, and they use their glands to throw scent. They're really not triggered a lot by cow calling unless you're near that full moon then there could be an older cow that's in heat that could trigger an estrus event. See how that works? Yep. But if there isn't an older cow that's in heat, they're really not very responsive to cow calls. It's more about bull to bull and challenges. When it comes to hunting, I go to the field with everything. Cow calls, elk Google tubes, diaphragm, open reeds, external calls, because every one of these will have a different pitch. And sometimes that different pitch will trigger a bull to fire up quicker than some other sounds that you're making. I've had guys tell me, all I do is cow call. Well, that's fine and dandy, but what about the days when they want to hear a bugle? If you're not equipped when you're out there, and you never know which day that's going to be. So you want to go to the woods equipped with everything possible so you can match those sounds on those days when you need to do it. Yeah, so the key to this season is really using cow-calf in movement, raking and thrashing, simulating another bull marking territory using fast chuckles for challenges, maybe use bull scent this time of year. I like to do what's called pre-kill your bull. Have you guys ever heard that? I go where a big bull lives, I walk in his neighborhood, and I rake trees and thrash and scream and chuckle fast, stomp the ground, leave bull scent, and walk off with cows. And a lot of times he'll answer me, but he's not real interested, and I'll leave. And I'll come back three days later and do it again. What happens is he thinks I'm an inferior bull and I left. He's dominant, that's his house. When I come back the second time, three days later, he comes on a string because now he knows who's the new kid on the block testing me. And a lot of times he comes in silent. I'll do all the calling, I'll turn around and he's right there ready to engage. So that's kind of that new kid on the block thing. Um, Mid-season, this is when peak breeding happens, about September 7th all the way till about October 2nd because a majority of your elk are three years old to seven years old. So most of them are gonna come into their heat on that September full moon three days after they grew. So they got a group first to trigger the pheromone. Once the pheromone triggers, then they go into cycle. 
Once they go into cycle, remember they're gonna be in heat for 18 hours. They need to breed. So that's why usually the third week in September, majority of elk, you see peak breeding. This is when you wanna bring in way more cow talk. Build excitement, introduce yourself. If you need to be a bull, be a bull and, and pre pretend like you're controlling your cows. Make, see, it's, a, it's playing a game with language. Anything you'd add to that in the peak breeding season? Well, you know, when you're out there in the field hunting, sometimes the elk just don't bugle, but you know they're there. And they're, they're actually moving around and feeding or whatever. You know there's elk there. We do what we call, I call it the Rocky's Ruckus. Some people call it the silent calling routine. But you just, if you have a hunting partner, set him downwind 20, 30 yards from you, 40 yards downwind from where you're at. So if that bull does come inside, he's locked in on that sound. The guy that's doing the shooting is going to be ambushing him on the side, but we'll start off with this silent calling routine, just going. And I start building on that. And Rocky, will you do it constant or will you do pause periods? I'll do that for a setup pretty steady as I build. And I'll bugle real lightly. That's all I do. And maybe I'll go one little time with an F bud. And I shut up. So in a sense, you're telling a story. Yes, I'm telling a story. I'm think I want those elk to think that there's something going on over there that they're missing out on. And I'll just sit there and be quiet for uh, it depends on the weather and stuff. But usually ten to fifteen minutes. I don't say a word. I just go take a nap. And I've actually heard the arrow go off shwack. Well, I'm taking a nap. Because the sneaking in, he's trying to do it. stuck in. Him. And that's a good way to spend the day when there's nothing else going on. Do those setups, but you've got to keep that wind in your favor. And or middle why, of the day. Yeah, that's why that hunter's so important to get him downwind and away from where the sound's at. Because those bulls, I've watched them come in real silent, and they'll stop at 50 yards out there, and they'll just stare for an hour, and they won't move. They'll just sit there and stare. So if that guy's out front of your shooter out there, 30, 40 yards, he's right there with him, and he can get a shot. So it works good. If you're by yourself, I try to find a setup where I'm against a rock ledge, a cliff, or some big windfalls, anything where I know that elk can't come in behind me on. And then I'll set up and call from there. And this is a trick that I've done, and I do it with my bugle too. I will set up and call from that spot do a lot of sounds like I just showed you and then I'll get up and I'll go down 30 40 yards and I'll sit and do that ambush trick and I do that with my bugling too when I'm by myself I will bugle from this spot if the bull answers I know he's coming I'm gonna move downwind what I call the half moon drive and I'm gonna get out there if I can get away with 40 yards that's where I'm going but sometimes only 10 feet is all it takes just get out there away from that sound is because they know to the inch where you just made that sound from. I don't care if you're a mile away, he knows exactly where that sound come from, and he's gonna to come to that spot. So by that ambush trick that I do, I've killed a lot of elk. They come in and they have no clue I'm off to the side. It works good. So the last phase, so think of the three phases. You have early and territorial, and think of the age of the animal, and the moon. Then you've got the middle season, which is peak breeding. Then you move into late season. And as you move into late season, you get way more weather, a lot of barometric shifts, you get snow, food changes. Most of the bigger bulls have finished their breeding for the herd, but remember the cows that didn't conceive, they'll come back in after 21 days to that late cycle. So there's nothing wrong with creating the scenario in the day and setting up. I've killed lots of bulls in late rifle season telling a rut story in the middle of the day. And after about 45 minutes, bulls have run in and gotten shot. Or in the morning, use your bugles for locate, because they'll still locate in the mornings to find each other. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of the late season ideal is calling works really well use optics of course high spot you know know where your bulls are um, but for those of you who may have questions if you want to learn more about elk language tactics or strategies you want to know more about biology or you just want to learn more about the tools and the calls come see us at booth 937 and uh, we'd love to help you so it's really about passing it on and we wish you guys a ton of success in the elk this year i want to thank everybody for coming i think the big crowd that